Um, we have Rebecca Fitzsimmons from Illinois State University. We have Rachel Walton from Rollins College and Erin Larmore of UNC Greensboro. And just as a reminder, we will take questions at the end of the session. So if you wanna put questions in the chat as we go along, you're welcome to do that, but we'll answer all of them at the end of the session. Um, all right, so I'm gonna turn it over to the presenters. Great, um, I'm gonna uh, start us out today. And um, I just a quick note, I'm going to leave my um, I'm going to be leaving my camera off because I had a small neck surgery yesterday. So while I'm fine, I've looked better <laughs> before. So apologies for that. Okay. And let me just. Sorry, let me rearrange my screen. So um, again, hello everyone. I'm Rebecca Fitzsimmons, a special collections librarian at Illinois State University. And today I'll be discussing various aspects of deep collaboration with faculty and students involving, um, uh, sorry, involving collection uh, development, grant writing, course design, and the development of a library exhibition using special collections materials. I've done many smaller projects using exhibits as teaching and research tools, but this project involved uh, restructuring an entire grad and undergrad art history class around research and exhibit work spread over the course of the fall semester that culminated in a show uh, at the beginning of the spring semester. So this project began about three years ago during a conversation with Dr. Saskia Baranek, who's an art history professor who was interested in exploring additional ways to use special collection materials in her courses. I teach several different types of sessions in her classes, including a focus on handling rare and archival materials in her research methods courses, but she was especially interested in developing a new collection that could grow over time and support other types of course offerings. So uh, Saskia is a Renaissance art scholar and was interested in developing a print history seminar that would incorporate research with original prints. We also brought in uh, Heather Copeman, our art librarian to collaborate. And together we identified a general focus for the print teaching collection, um, which was European prints from 1400 to 1700, featuring different methods of print production and a variety of subjects. We also decided whenever possible to pursue works designed by or that were printed by women. We felt that the collaboration would be a really good fit for our library because it would support interdisciplinary research across multiple fields. And it would also fill a gap in locally available resources because there's really not many easily accessible opportunities to study such prints in Bloomington, Norble, and really more broadly in our central Illinois region. Um, so by spring semester 2022, we had acquired uh, 22 prints for the uh, print teaching collection. And as we all know, the best way to really learn about art is to experience it firsthand. So with this idea, uh, we decided to transform the class using a largely flipped instructional model of focusing on collaborative experiential learning. And so Saskia and I applied for and we were awarded a university teaching grant to completely redesign her print course. From the beginning, we talked about ways that the prints could be incorporated into this course with the intent of moving beyond uh, essay writing. We were most interested in giving students an opportunity to work closely with the physical materials while developing a project that would extend beyond the classroom. With this in mind, we decided to build on existing library resources by having the students work together to curate an exhibit, which we installed at the beginning of the, uh, the following semester. We also planned a digital publication with longer essays to be built using the Scalar platform. We requested funds to bring in two outside museum scholars to share their expertise with the students, to pay for a museum visit and a discussion with the curator of a Dutch print show that was installed at the time, and to pay for graphic design services from the Design Streak Studio program, which is a hands-on course at ISU where students take on real-world design briefs. Uh, other elements of the redesign included that I would teach exhibit curation, design, and planning along with research methods. We also had the prints digitized for easier offsite access and related digital projects with the idea that the student's research might also be used to expand the metadata in the digital collection. So the deliverables for the project were supposed to be created by class participants from start to finish through the research and writing of all their supporting documents, wall text, promotional materials, and critical essays uh, that were meant to contextualize these pre-modern printed images against a backdrop of the printing revolution in Europe. 
Uh, we held recurring meetings and special collections throughout the semester, starting with conversations about material handling practices, access, and examining how the prints fit with other materials held by special collections. An important part of the early process was having students select a print that piqued their curiosity and that they could envision working with for an entire semester. During these sessions, we facilitated discussions about where to take their research, how to build an exhibit around a narrative, and how writing for exhibit audiences is different than writing essays. We had visiting print scholars join two of the special collections working sessions, moving around the room chatting with students about their research and thematic arrangements, which helped tremendously in pushing their ideas forward. The class where we focused on how rare books could be used to contextualize their chosen prints and expand their research was a key moment for many of the students in understanding what cura curatorial practice looks like. In considering related materials, it encouraged them to expand their thinking and push the exhibit themes beyond their initial ideas. For example, after the entire class had grouped their prints into themes of religion, travel, and portraits, the students in each group refined these themes to sections that focused on parables of the divine that push the broad idea of travel to focus on exploration, the pursuit of knowledge, and that examine the relationship of portrait painting to publishing and the roles of mentorship polish, uh, politics and money in early print production. Throughout the semester, we talked about ways that exhibit design helps or can sometimes hurt um, effective communication, but Heather and I also held a highly focused uh, session on design and layout near the end of the class where we visited the exhibit space. That working session involved finalizing object placements, graphic elements, including color and typography choices, and uh, design responsibilities. Some ongoing student needs and challenges that Heather and I both observed were that many uh, of these students needed help identifying contextual research directions beyond the basic facts of the print, and that many also struggled with gaining comfort with ambiguity and research um, as an organic process. Uh, so now I'll discuss some of the primary outcomes of the project and uh, the lessons that we learned throughout the collaborative project. And um, it's probably no surprise, spoiler, we plan for a lot more than we could actually accomplish during the semester. Uh, so there were a few things that we had to let go from our original plan uh, due to some unexpected circumstances, such as Saskia being called away from the class for several weeks in the middle and the end of the semester, and the design streak professor uh, needing to back out of the design portion of the project. Um, however, we then had some extra money from the grant because we didn't create a related exhibit publication, we didn't pay for the design streak student services, and uh, we did all of the printing and mounting for the exhibit in-house. So this presented a great opportunity to reallocate those funds uh, to allow our students to select and purchase a couple of prints for the collection. So these are the two works, a botanical illustration by Maria Sibila Marion and a map by an anonymous engraver from Sebastian Munster's uh, 1544 book, Cosmographia. And what was especially valuable about this exercise was it gave students a window into collection development with all the pra practical and ethical considerations that can arise. They also had to consider the existing print collection and identify new pieces uh, that could fill perceived gaps they identified while fitting within the parameters and scope of the existing collection policy. And here you see one of the prints from the archival line exhibit and the label copy alongside the metadata record for the print and a couple of screenshots of the digitized print collection. We talked at length during the semester about the different ways the information is communicated, including through essays, label copy, and metadata. And in this case, some of the information the student found about this print um, in an obscure catalog that detailed the bigger series um, includes the full official title of the work, which was used to update the object record and the finding aid for the collection. And we're really excited to build on this kind of work for future classes. So the major outcome of the project was a student developed exhibit held in the library during the spring semester following the end of the course. What we see here is a section label, intro panel, and acknowledgments panel created for the exhibit. The students wrote all the label copy, created the exhibit title, and developed a visual scheme that incorporated images pulled from the prints that helped to depict the exhibit's primary themes. And uh, one case here shows the original artwork created by two MFA students enrolled in the class, um, and their works were inspired by the research they did during the course. Other show, um, the other shows uh, two student selected prints purchased by the class alongside an overview of the process and the thumbnails of the entire collection for context, and then just a close up of part of the installation view. So some lessons that we learned were to allow more time and structure uh, for things that took longer than expected, such as educating students at all skill levels on design best practices. Fair distribution of the workload among the students was a challenge. And uh, due to changes in how the design work was originally planned, some students, such as upper level graphic design majors, were asked to do more because of their perceived skill sets. In the rush to complete design work, some work was incomplete and Illustrator and InDesign files were improperly packaged. And this created a huge amount of additional work for me to rebuild those files after the students had left for the semester. In the future, we definitely need to provide more, uh, we need to really more clearly articulate and plan for design related tasks. We need to be ready to pivot when needed and to allocate more work time between the semester and installation. 
Uh, helping students focus their interpretations in a way that's appropriate for exhibit labeling was a very iterative process requiring lots of interaction with the librarians and the professor. It's a different style of writing, so it was important for us to continue to emphasize editing and to uh, remind the students to avoid just including kind of fun facts about a work. With regard to layout and groupings, we talked frequently about the concept of storytelling or how there was an overarching narrative that the class created and that each section and each individual label within that section really needed to support this overall narrative. As for the associated digital exhibit catalog I mentioned earlier, we learned a few things there too. So originally we intended to make this available with the opening of the show, but due to time constraints, we really had to reconsider. Uh, this has caused us to think about what's kind of best to share. Uh, initially, we intended to share everyone's essays, um, but we've arrived at a small se uh, selection of their essays and these still need light editing, but eventually these are going to form the basis of a future publication that can continue to expand each time the class is offered, creating opportunities for richer and more exciting thematic developments and varying interpretations to emerge. And so in conclusion, uh, at the end of the semester, several students expressed how shocked they were at all the planning and work that goes into an exhibit, even when it's a fairly small one. We're thrilled that even if they never curate another exhibit, they have a new level of appreciation and understanding of all the collaboration and work that goes into exhibit planning in order to ensure effective communication in this format. There's plans to hold the print seminar every other year, and the professor is really keen to revisit the student ex uh, exhibition creation process, but we're also discussing other projects such as digital publications and other ideas that could be the culminating projects um, arising from a semester of focused research. I'm really excited to see what new research and findings future students are going to uncover from this collection too. And just uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm always happy to share information or engage in digital or other types of collaborations. I really love working with people on exciting projects and so thank you for your time today. And I'm going to stop sharing. <laughs> Okay, so I am going to, uh, Rachel could not be with us today uh, because she uh, has a travel issue. So I'm going to press play on her presentation. She, she sent a digital, uh, she sent a pre-recording version of it. So let's see here. Yes. Screen. Okay. Undergraduate seniors, digital humanities, and archival skills with a locating legacies uh, database project can serve as a case study. For those in the audience who are thinking about potentially this kind of project in their own working context, whether it be um, a pedagogical innovation in the archives or incorporating digital humanities, humanities work into your teaching. Let me just talk a little bit about me and what I do in my role. My name is Rachel Walton, and for nine years, I've been a digital archivist at Rollins College, a small private liberal arts school in the Orlando area. While my job as digital archivist tasks me with quite a bit, including acquiring, preserving, and providing access to digital and other resources with historic significance to the college, I'm also called upon to do a fair amount of classroom teaching and liaison work. And over the years, I've had an opportunity to teach many, in many formats and capacities from one-shot instruction to more of an embedded librarian model. But it's with the history department that I've really been able to experiment with curriculum design and flex new pedagogical muscles. Um, and so today, that's kind of what I want to speak to you about. Um, I work with Dr. Claire Strong, who's featured here. Um, in this uh, slide with me to redesign a history capstone class this last spring in 2024. I'm going to talk to you more about that class. So every, every spring, I teach a component of the 400 level history capstone course, which students complete in the final semester as history majors um, and soon to be graduates. The component of the course that I teach is intended to allow an applied history context that has both a public history focus and an archival um, task associated with it. And my goals for this portion of the course are really threefold, and I have the line up here for you. The first is that students understand how and why an archives functions as a public history space and 
with very unique methods and um, intentional practices. The second is that students um, have an assignment that requires mastery of primary source literacy skills, which is absolutely essential, of course, for history majors. Uh, and the final is, and this is really critical given my expertise in digital archives work, um, I really wanted to expose students to digital humanities methods. I wanted to help them understand how digital archives are different, what digital competencies they might need, and what, look, what it looks like to build digital collections. Um, in the past, we've run projects for this uh, class that help students create publicly safety research products um, from their uh, archives experiences, or make these digital exhibits, blog posts, online collections. But this spring, we followed this similar model to partner with a new group, and this group is out of Sewanee, uh, led by Professor Woody Register in the History Department and Tiffany Moman with the Roberson Project on Slavery, Race, and Reconciliation. They were looking for collaborators last year, and uh, we're dedicated to this kind of interesting, ambitious digital humanities project called the Locating Slavery's Legacy Database. I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about that um, project and the database and why we decided to get involved. Um, so the Locating Slavery's Legacy Database is um, live and online. You can go to it here and provide the URL if you do get a chance to explore it. Um, and those of you who find yourself in higher ed, maybe those of you who like are like me and find yourself at a historic Southern college, understand that for generations after the Civil War, colleges established across the American South were erecting memorials and monuments that honored symbols of the Confederacy and the Lost Cause. And likewise, that was an interesting time in American history where um, historically, Black colleges were also being created, and um, institutions like that and like then were establishing memorials to refute these claims about white supremacy and the Confederacy. Um, and this dynamic really continued into the 20th century throughout the Jim Crow era, and then even in more complex ways as a response to the mid-century civil rights movement um, in the states. So that complex history that I'm kind of describing briefly here is what the Locating Slavery's Legacy Database Project is serving. It serves as a central repository for information about this dynamic history of memorials, and it does this through markers. When I say markers, I mean um, uh, items that have been described and mapped um, across the landscape of Southern academic institutions. Um, and these items might be monuments, memorials, like plaques, they could be events, they could be individuals, um, but they're associated with the college's history. Um, the database is currently populated through a crowdsource effort um, by teams of instructors, archivists, and students from what are, I think they now have seven participating colleges. Um, and each of these groups or individuals contribute entries to the database based on their specific campus histories and geographies. And I just want to say that Sewanee is still looking for collaborators. So if this sounds like a good project for you, please contact them and they would love to work with you. So the context of our spring history capstone class, contributing to the database, uh, making this a part of the course, took the form of kind of a long-term assignment in which each student researched and created database entries for three campus monuments, memorials, or even historic persons that aligned with the database's thematic scope. Um, so let me talk to you a little bit about some of the steps we took to implement this. Um, and then uh, I can talk to you about maybe some of the impacts and outcomes of this work. So at the beginning of the class, we set up a virtual technical orientation with the project's lead or um, technical lead, October Kamara. Uh, she was invaluable to our work in understanding the requirements for the fields in the database. She gave the students an in-depth overview of the online documentation, which a component of that you see here, standard procedures, you know, controlled vocabulary, and that served us really well in the course of this project. 
Next, the students, after spending really several class periods, um, actually several weeks in the archives, they're, you know, immersed in the materials and thinking about their topic of any subject matter, they drafted database entries into a spreadsheet template. Um, and this was, the intention of this was for them to get peer review, so review each other's, but also feedback from me as the archivist. Um, and this is an example of one of the spreadsheet entries that um, we did for that drafting and review process. Finally, um, when students were able to utilize feedback, make edits, and do further research as needed, they prepared their final database entries um, for submission to the online portal, which you see here. This is a portal um, that is underneath a custom Omeka S site, if there, for those of you who are familiar with that. This content was reviewed both by the database manager, October Kamara, um, and also me for grading purposes before being released online. So that's a little bit about the how. Uh, uh, let me talk to you a little bit about the results of this work. So um, students really enjoyed this project. And you know, I just want to stop and say that it's really important to reflect on your teaching um, and it be an honest reflection. So that's what I'm trying to provide here. Dr. Strom and I have convened actually very recently. And so these are the kind of takeaways we've gleaned as instructors. Um, the students really explored their topics deeply and were very invested in the work. They um, managed a lot of source material well and even dealt with competing and conflicting information about their topics. And they were really deeply diving into the historical complexity of our campus history. So in that way, it was a huge success. Some of the areas that we saw students fall down in this process was in utilizing controlled vocabularies in their descriptions. Not only was the why behind that sometimes unclear, but students failed to practice kind of an attention to detail that's needed for that work. Um, keeping them in scope sometimes was an interesting experiment. Sometimes they were able to do, to do it other times. Um, they still veered a little bit off course with their subject matter. And then finally, students were, who were all very accomplished researchers and writers, when we asked them to transfer that knowledge base about, you know, uh, quality source indicators and careful proofreading to a metadata um, descriptive context, they, they lost some of those standards in that process. So I think there's more opportunity for us to provide better scaffolding in the future for this and for us to um, kind of help them along the way think about those quality indicators. These realizations have led Professor Strom and I on a new path that we're really excited about. We're interested in how this type of project helps build students' historical empathy. And we're working with a member of the psychology department now for a plan in the fall to survey students in these kind of course contexts to try and gauge what historical empathy is and if it grows across the course of the semester. I want to end my discussion today by really thinking about the impact of this work on our campus and on our students um, and how this can make us better and bolder archivists. And so I guess I'll have my, my soapbox alert now. Um, here in this slide, you can see the black and white photos show a Coquina Bench Memorial on our campus dedicated to Francis Philip Fatio, who was in uh, a landowner um, many generations before um, these uh, memorial structures were erected in the early 1940s. Uh, this uh, bench on campus was installed in a small courtyard in the fall of 2003, or rather reinstalled after campus construction projects removed it from campus for several years. Um, and in that reinstallment ceremony, which was super uh, overseen by the head of archive with special collections and the college president, there was a, a speech that talked about Francis, Francis Philip Fatio's significant contribution to early Florida environmental conservation and that movement. 
That is true. Fatia was indeed very concerned about conserving the natural resources of the state, but he was a large landowner and he made his money off of traditional plantation agriculture. So key to his business was slave labor. And this was a detail, an important detail, that history student Liam King, who's featured here in the Raleigh's blue shirt, um, immediately uncovered in researching this particular memorial on campus, and he was absolutely livid. He decided to take action. He was uh, adamant he was going to make change. He interviewed the head of the Archives and Special Collections about the decision to reinstall the bench. He contacted the president's office to lodge an official complaint. He wrote to the student newspaper. He set up a meeting with the Office of Campus Inclusion to talk about, quote, immediate steps that we can can be taken to rectify this injustice. So I know what some of you are thinking, oh no, that can't be good for the archives. That can't be good for college PR. Let me push back on that a little bit. If we're to make positive change on our campuses and with our students, we need to be bold and brave and even self-critical. We need to call out injustices, even if we have as an archive or archivist been somehow complicit in creating them. We need to encourage and empower our students that the fruit of their research be shared openly and widely without worrying about what it means for the college's reputation. And we need to foster and inform and be at the center of difficult conversations about the legacy of racism in our communities. I'm really proud of Liam and I can't wait to update his entry in the Locating Slavery's Legacy Database to say altered or removed for this bench to show that that legacy of slavery on our campus is being slowly and intentionally eroded by us and our fantastic students. Thank you so much for your time today. Please reach out with questions. I can't wait to hear from you. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Not to figure out how to stop sharing. Okay. Uh, we good? Okay. Assuming that everybody can see that, I am good. Yeah, okay. Yes. Awesome. So I'm going to talk about a project that is part of my work as the University Archivist and Student Engagement Coordinator at UNC Greensboro Special Collections and University Archives. And specifically, this has to do with something that's often known as a CURE, C-U-R-E. It's an acronym for course-based undergraduate research experience. Typically, a CURE involves an entire class addressing a novel research question with unknown outcomes that continue, contributes to or may lead to original research. The students aren't just writing a research or analysis paper. They're actually actively participating in and, most importantly, helping guide the entire research process. And there's a ton of research out there that shows that students who participate in cures experience a wide range of positive outcomes, such as increased confidence, increased persistence in continuing research and continuing learning. Cures can also help break through some barriers that might be in place for traditionally underrepresented student groups, like students who have a more difficult time establishing traditional mentor-mentee one-on-one relationships with faculty due to issues like lack of time outside of class because they're working one or more jobs, um, lack of information or coaching on how to seek out those types of experience. So all of this ties in because of course, special collections and archives are the ideal environment for this kind of research. We're basically a lab and a lab, not just for humanists, but for basically any field. And with University Archives, we have resources related to one topic in particular that actually unites all of our students across all disciplines with all the backgrounds, and that's the university itself. So I want to give you an example of a cure that I managed to that uses university history and university archives as the lab for their work. This is a course that I've taught in our undergraduate honors college called Who Lives, Who Dies, Who Tells Your Story, University History and Digital. So in the past, I took a more traditional approach to the class's final project. Each student selected a research topic. Their topic just needed to, to make use of university archives. Beyond that, they could focus on any aspect of university history that they wanted. And each of these students ended up working kind of in a silo. 
While I did reserve several class sessions for research in the archives, each student just worked independently on their own and on their own project. And as many presentations go, then came COVID. In spring of 2021, the course transitioned to a virtual setting and access to our reading room was limited. So we shifted the class focus from this type of in-depth individual research to a group research project. We also switched from focusing more on archival research to one focused on archival documentation. As a class, we worked together to select a topic for our final project. Unsurprisingly, the students chose documenting the undergraduate experience at UNCG during COVID. The students brainstormed key communities they could address with their documentation work. They began conducting oral history interviews with fellow students to explore issues. And as a final product, they created a website as well as a group presentation that documented many of the challenges faced by our undergrads. These students really love the process and the power that comes from designing their own project. So I continued this mindset once our reading room restrictions were lifted and our class was firmly moved back to a face-to-face -face instruction. In spring 2023, I once again taught this honors college class and I continued the focus on a group project with individual components. Basically, everyone had their pieces, but they fed into a larger hole. And once again, I really let the students take the wheel when it came to determining the scope of the project, the anticipated project outcomes, and even the timeline for completion. So the students in that semester became quite interested in the notion of the campus's hidden history. Things they learned about the class, but wouldn't have learned otherwise, even though they see them, they pass them every single day. They wanted to share these stories in a more visible way. So one student proposed the title, Something Happened Here. And as a group, we decided we would use yard signs, like political yard signs types of things that had QR codes on them to point people to web pages that contained more information about an important person or an event tied to a specific location. I will say these yard signs were printed at a relatively cheap cost. It was about $140 for 25 signs with the stakes. And the QR codes were printed on waterproof paper to ensure that they would last in any weather. And then we glued them on just with basic Gorilla Glue. On the next to last day of class, students actually hosted a guided tour of their sites. This tour was advertised to anyone on campus who wished to attend. But also the yard signs themselves were up on campus for three full weeks, covering the final week of classes all the way through the end of commencement weekend. So the student's work was available to view at any, by, at any time by anybody. Not only were the students able to do research, but they were able to present it to the public in a fun and engaging way. And most importantly to some of them, they were able to show it off to their family and friends at the end of the semester. So at Curelate, this is an excellent opportunity for university archives to function as a lab for humanistic study. It also allows us to clearly align our work and mission with the university's focus on undergraduate student success. And it helps our students better understand the world that's immediately around them. But as you might guess, it's not always easy um, to do this type of work. Um, access restrictions due to our more limited hours of operation can certainly present a problem. If one of the purposes of a cure is to provide research experiences to students who might not have the free time to pursue research outside of a classroom setting, we're gonna run into a lot of trouble if we're asking the students to spend a significant amount of free time in the archives. Also, to be blunt, supporting this type of class is a lot of work. Think about how much time you might spend working one-on-one -on -one with a student conducting research in your reading room. Now multiply that by 12, 15, 18 students converging on the reading room at one time to do research. It can be time consuming and sometimes an exhausting experience. So we have to be honest with ourselves about the work that will also result from the end of a course-based undergraduate research experience. Ultimately, cures require us and everyone else involved to accept mistakes and sometimes even utter failure. Learning, again, is the process. Is, uh, learning the process is the key here. We don't have an expected outcome. Remember, discovery is an important characteristic of a cure. And we also shouldn't expect the students to produce perfect, successful research during this process. Again, they're learning. So with course-based undergraduate research, we're looking to support students who are learning a process without a strong focus on the final product. And yes, archivist, more process, less product. The E in CURE stands for experience, and that's exactly what a CURE is. It's an opportunity for students to experience the research process. 
We all know that the research process isn't linear. You find dead ends, you struggle, you make mistakes, and that's okay. It's expected. That process is vital in academic research, but it's also important to teach our students so that they can remember it in any other aspect of life. By advocating for and supporting cures that make use of university archives, we can ensure that these types of experiences, the experiences that focus on teaching and learning a process over producing a final perfect product are available to a wider range of our students on equal footing. So I'm a big believer in the power of archives, the power to educate, the power to inspire, and the power to provide accountability. Cures in our archives give all of our students the opportunity to experience that power, to learn the process of archival research and to use archives in a new and innovative way. It gives them a chance to learn more about the university they've chosen to attend, and ultimately maybe even more about how they can grow personally or how they can help the university grow while they're here or once they graduate. It's a lot of work on the librarians and archivists, on other faculty members and on the students themselves, but I promise it's worth it. And so with that, as the last person here, I'm going to uh, open things up to questions. Erin, I just wanna jump in and say, this is a wonderful project. And um, I'm so pleased to see you talking so much about the process and how we need to leave space for learning and failures and kind of the iterative nature of research and how important it is to allow that space for students to learn. We don't, I think, talk about that enough, right? But it is just such a, a, a fundamental experience for students to be able to have and have that space to try and, and like you said, fail sometimes. It's so important. Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, and I think it does give students, um, I think they take it into other classes too. I've had students tell me that what they learned in this class about the process is something that they felt more comfortable. They felt more comfortable doing in-depth research the further they got in their career. Most of the students in my class are freshmen, um, a handful of sophomores, but it lets them know that they can do it and it lets them experience research in an environment that's less, I'll be honest, I use an ungrading method for the class. The students sign a labor contract at the beginning of the class. Um, and if they fulfill their labor contract, basically if they do the work and they show and prove that they have worked hard and they've tried, they're pretty much gonna get an A in the class. And particularly because these are freshman honor students, they tend, they tend to be a little on the type A side and they want everything perfect and they're scared to try new things. And so it opens a door for, for trying that can help them later in other classes too. I had a question for Aaron as well um, to follow up. Um, do you think you'll be doing this project again in the future and from what you have learned, like, do you have any ideas on how you would want to tweak it? Or is this a class you would want to also do potentially with older students and not just freshmen and sophomores? Um, personally, I am planning, hoping to teach it again soon, but um, still with primarily freshmen and sophomores, that's just the way that our honors college is structured. I will say that one of the joys of teaching it in the honors class is not only that I can be the instructor of record as someone who's not a teaching faculty member on campus, but the classes are purposefully small. This is a seminar class, so it's capped at 15. And for this type of project, I think, you know, if you have more than 12 or 15 students, collaborative work is going to lose a chunk of them along the way. They're just going to sit quietly. But if you're an instructor and you have 12 students, you can tell when someone's kind of slipping and address it sooner rather than later. Um, I also find honestly that introducing this kind of methodology to students as early in their career does help them later. Um, not that it couldn't be used for an upper level class, but I think there's a lot of value for it being something students capture early, not only the research part of it, but just the university history part. If they're gonna be there on campus, hopefully for four or sometimes more years, um, they can better understand the area around them and um, 
you know, hopefully I, I've had students who laugh because they tell me their friends get tired of them pointing out things on campus that they've learned in class and saying, did you know this happened there? So they do take it forward. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's something that I think is reusable. I will say the one thing I did learn is don't expect to get the signs back at the end <laughs> of the semester. <laughs> um, I, I went around after commencement to try to collect them and I only was able to collect a third of them because I was planning on reusing them. But um, that, that was my main takeaway at the end of the semester. But, you know, the budget is a relatively small budget, but it is a budget. It does require some sort of right. um, That's kind of the one thing that I might tweak in the future is knowing that that's happening. I, I didn't know that before the class started because the whole idea came out of the students themselves. And so mm -hmm. I think planning ahead for having that small budget to work with would be a, a good thing. And I'll add, um, you asked about um, working with uh, more um, advanced students with the same kind of process. And while it's really wonderful to get in at that beginning um, stages of their of their education, like Aaron did, um, I was working with um, almost exclusively upper level students and even in grad students, and they still benefited from learning that process of deep research because many of them hadn't had that experience um, earlier on in their careers. So I think you know at, at any stage that you can jump in um, and and incorporate that into instruction is is always incredibly valuable. Um, we also have a question in the chat and I think this could go for Rebecca or Erin. Um, it says I'm Caroline at LSU Special Collections and I'm curious about what types of preparation before the class were made at the library or archive for staff to be prepared for working with the students in a more hands-on way. Rebecca, I don't know if you want to take that, but I can say, I mean, when I mentioned that the class can be uh, somewhat exhausting, I was both the instructor and the archivist who prepared everything for the students. <laughs> so, you know, I was wearing, in most situations, I think the archivist was wearing the hat of archivist and not the hat of archivist and instructor of record. Um, so, you know, uh, one of the things that was done, honestly, was time was carved out for me. Um, we, I was able to get kind of what, what would be the equivalent of a teaching faculty member getting a course release, where I actually had a chunk of time dedicated to teaching and supporting this class that, you know, typically when we have other instructional sessions, it just kind of bundles into my overall job responsibilities. So having time specifically carved out for me was honestly necessary for this. Um, so I was um, an instructor of record alongside um, the art history faculty member. So I was able to split those um, sort of teaching responsibilities uh, with that with that instructor and we also pulled in the um, um, art librarian to do a lot of um, the components that had to do with other types of research that weren't necessarily specifically involving archives so it, I think spreading that workload out between the three of us helped tremendously um, but I will say I didn't um, I didn't have a course release or you know anything like that so it did get incorporated into my <laughs> regular semester and um, so there there were there were points when there was a lot of sort of um, individual meetings, you know, to flesh out research processes and help individual students. Um, we had sixteen students in the in the class, so not you know an insurmountable number of, of students to work with, um, but some of them did uh, require a lot of individualized attention, and um, I think kind of thankfully utilized all three of us. Um, um, to, to kind of get that research attention um, where it did, um, I think in future semesters would need more planning um, is towards the end where I wound up picking up a lot of the workload to get things installation ready um, for the exhibition. And part of that had to do with, uh, it was, you know, still enough into COVID times that some, some unexpected things popped up um, and the design streak professor, uh, we ordinarily would have been working with her as well to uh, cover some of the design uh, principles and have her students work with our students to sort of extend the learning to another class. And she, 
just forgot entirely <laughs> that she had agreed to do it. And so that fell through. Um, and so uh, preparation, I think, um, uh, in future, uh, we'll need to have kind of a, a better plan B other than, okay, now we all have to rush to get <laughs> to get everything done. Um, so, I, you know, for me, that was uh, a learning experience in itself to kind of plan for plan for things that you think are never going to be an issue. Um, I don't know that that is the most helpful in having a nice pat answer for how perfectly we handled everything, but you know, this is the reality of this kind of work, I think for everyone involved. Well, thank you guys again for your wonderful presentations. Um, I'm going to put Rachel's email address in the chat for anybody who might have questions about her presentation. Um, we're going to go ahead and take a break right now before we go into the next session. So we'll see you back here in about 15 minutes. <laughs>